interdepartmental meeting and uh, it's, I'm going to just very quickly say, introduce you to uh, Goodman Sibeko, who actually needs no real introduction as our head of addiction psychiatry. Um, but just to briefly acknowledge that this is a very special meeting because we also have the involvement of higher health, um, about which Goodman will say more, but they've had an enormous interest in mental health in students across uh, multiple learning institutions in South Africa. So that's, that's awesome to see that. And we're also just to say thank you to our deanery, um, who's recently um, supported meetings on addiction psychiatry, on student mental health, and um, have been very supportive of this issue. So over to you, Goodman, to introduce everyone else, and thank you for doing so. Uh, thank you, Diane. I just uh, want to acknowledge first the attendance of the deanery. Thank you to Prof. Uh, Green Thompson for being in attendance today, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Thank you to Dr. Tracy Naledi, the Deputy Dean of Health Services, and Dr. Karen Begg, the Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Education, for making time to be with us today. I want to acknowledge as well the attendance of Ms. Carol Dean, the Director of Specialized Services for Western Cape uh, Government. And thank you to the three speakers for taking time today to uh, prepare their talks and uh, for, for giving us their time today. Uh, the order today is that we're first going to have Dr. Lisa Dunnett, who uh, largely needs a little introduction uh, for this group. Uh, she's gonna provide us with an overview of the local burden of substance use disorders amongst uh, youth in higher learning. Um, Dr. Dunnett is a consultant psychiatrist here at Fortiskir and is a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health. Uh, at UCT, and she currently manages the Emergency Psychiatric Service and the Addiction Psychiatry Outpatients Clinic here uh, at Fuerteski. She'll be followed by our main speaker, um, Ms. Florencia Mans Fuentalida, who will deliver her talk uh, on behalf of the project. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to do that any justice, so I'll use the English version and she can sort of present it correctly later in full faculties of health and community foundation in Spain uh, to deliver the main talk, which uh, as you would all be aware is titled Drug Use Prevention and Harm Reduction Amongst Youth Through Peer-to-Peer -peer Education. Um, after Ms. Mans Fonsalida has spoken, we'll hear from Dr. Vincent Vashiri, who's the Technical Executive Manager at Higher Health, and he's going to outline for us the Higher Health Model for Implementation of an ADA program among students in the post-school education and training sector. I think Lisa, you can go ahead and start putting your slides up. So what we're really hoping is that these engagements will be helpful in helping us think through some of our own current and future efforts uh, to tackle substance use disorders in higher health at UCT and beyond. Um, following these presentations, Dr. Karen Beg is gonna come in and close for us uh, with some reflections uh, uh, for the faculty. Thank you, Lisa, you can take it away. Sorry, just battling to unmute myself. Um, Good. All right. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak today. Today, I will be discussing substance use and substance use disorders within the South African context, how this pertains to the youth and to students engaged in higher learning. And I will draw on existing evidence and some experiences. Um, Okay, I hope you can all see my first slide. So substance use is common in South Africa. According to the SASH study done many years ago, um, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis are the most common substances used. And not all people who use substances develop substance use disorders. People who experiment with substances do so for a variety of reasons. If the effects are positive, the person may go on to use recreationally and then to use in a harmful way. Usually these people can vary their substance use over time, but are able to stop spontaneously. However, a minority of people develop a substance use disorder and cannot use in a controlled manner. 
A substance use disorder is defined as a maladaptive pattern of substance use that leads to impairment or distress and is characterized by impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacological changes, including tolerance and withdrawal. Coming back to the SASH study, they sh showed a significant lifetime prevalence of common mental disorders. Anxiety disorders were the most common at 15%, closely followed by substance use disorders at 13.3%. According to Sikendu, the most common substance use disorders for which people seek treatment nationally includes first cannabis, then alcohol, then opiates, and methamphetamine. Other drugs in South Africa are less common. This is, of course, treatment data and may not reflect all substances used. Important to note is that the Western Cape has the highest rate of substance use in population-based surveys, and methamphetamine remains the most common drug for which individuals present for substance use treatment services at 29%. Moving on to substance use among the youth. Substance use and substance use disorders are more common among the youth, including adolescents and young adults. So the 13 to 25 year age group than among older adults. The most common substances used are again alcohol, cannabis, sedatives, including prescription drugs, and stimulants such as speed, ecstasy, methamphetamine, and cocaine. Again, the Western Cape has higher rates of substance use among the youth, and substance use is substance use is higher among the youth due to a variety of factors. So Norman Zinberg proposed that the development of a substance use disorder is due to a complex interplay between the drug itself, the person using, which is referred to as the set, and the environment, environment or setting in which use occurs. Regarding the set, young people are more likely to use substances than older people because of, firstly, a biological predisposition. This is an imbalance between the prefrontal cortex responsible for higher functions and the limbic system based reward pathways. In adolescence and early adulthood, the reward pathway is highly sensitized, whereas uh, to substance use and to reward, whereas the prefrontal cortex develops throughout early adolescence and early adulthood. So essentially there's no handbrake on the reward pathway. Other factors predisposing young people to use substances include a developing need for autonomy with the formation of new social groups and peer pressure to fit in. Additionally, a past history of traumas, including physical and emotional trauma, may predispose to substance use and substance use disorders. Further substance use disorders in more, is more common in men than women more common in individuals of mixed race and more common in young people from peri-urban settings. Drug factors include the easy accessibility of these drugs. It's very easy to, unfortunately, it's very easy to buy drugs in observatory. Um, the amount that people are using, the frequency that people are using, and the legal status of drugs, particularly the changing legal status of cannabis, People assume that because drugs uh, such as alcohol and tobacco are legal and cannabis is decriminalized, that they are not risky. Further, drugs are inexpensive. Methamphetamine is about 50 rand, cannabis about 20, and uh, heroin 30, so cheap. And then these drugs all predispose to the development of tolerance and withdrawal. Lastly, we need to consider the environmental factors that play a role in substance use, including unemployment, poverty, stresses, social deprivation, who you are using with and access to treatment. In South Africa, I would say that the environment is very important. Um, adolescence and youth is marked by a strive for independence, moving to new environments and increased exposure to new people and new experiences. So moving on to the context of the students, um, as discussed, young adulthood is a time of transition emotionally, physically, and socially with young people changing their living 
in arrangements, relationship status, and scholarly and employment activities. Students may move away from home and be faced with new academic and social pressures. Additionally, substance use and substance experimenting with substances may seem to be the norm. The previously mentioned antecedents to substance use and substance use disorders would apply to students. For example, an older study conducted among university students in uh, the North in South Africa found that students with higher rates of psychiatric comorbidity, higher rates of perceived stress, greater sensation seeking behavior and poorer self-esteem were all at risk for substance use and substance use disorders. The substance, this study was conducted at one university and it would be important to consider context specific risk and protective factors to plan substance use and substance use interventions within our context. So I have been working in emergency psychiatry and addiction psychiatry at Curtis Care Hospital for several years. And our emergency psych team has been asked to assess, admit, and manage UCT students on many occasions. The frequency of these admission appears to increase during stressful periods, including exams, protests, the return to classes during the pandemic, and following the fire in April of this year. It is striking how many of the students requiring admission to acute psychiatry are also using substances. This concern has been echoed by the emergency medicine team and in a conversation with Memory Muturiki, who heads up the um, student wellness services. At this point, there are no individual substance use treatment options for the students. And I would surmise that taking time out from busy coursework to attend a, a substance use treatment program is difficult. I recently reached out to a group of international colleagues working in the addictions field to ask if any of them had had similar experiences working with students. I was introduced to today's speaker, Floor, and Floor and I met over Zoom to discuss their rather exciting peer-to-peer -peer substance education um, program. It sounds interesting, dynamic, and accessible for students, which is why we have invited her to speak today. I'm now going to hand over to Flo. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Lisa. Um, should I go now, right? <laughs> okay, I, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Florencia. I am from, well, I am staying right now in Barcelona. And I'm going to share with you where I am working for. Yeah. So I present my where I work is the in full faculties or in Spanish would be in plenas facultades. It means that you have your well, all your faculties to make your choice. And with this uh, word uh, game, no, with uh, faculties, university, well, we have this project since. Um, 1999 so we we have been like 20 years almost um give me one second i have a little problem here uh, one second okay it's okay now now it's. so um i'm going to present uh my project our project so um we started in 1999 uh, because there was a European project, it was uh, it was called Away from Home. It's like an Erasmus Erasmus or exchange program uh, where students from different universities could uh, make an exchange, well, uh, between European countries, right? But the thing was, um, these Erasmus students they were young, they were living their first. Experience their own uh, first experience on uh, have the uh, plus 18 and have access to this liberty to, uh, to choose what to do and so on. And then we, they, when, they, when they were coming to the other country and they coming back to their home countries, they were like uh, unestablished. So 
they were like more uh, the subiquet, they have mm, mm, struggling with drugs problem or risk, uh, well, potential risk situations. So um, health, uh, um, health and community foundations uh, detect this problem and they say, well, if we are going to send our students for this exchange of experience that is super rich for them because they, they see another reality, they can learn more for their own professional future and everything, we need to send them prepared because if not, they are not going to handle all the risk and benefits of being adult or a young adult, right? So uh, they started this uh, project program and our object objective was uh, promote training and preventing actions to provide university students with tools for the drug use, abuse, sexuality and other risk behavior, okay? Uh, how, we, um, how we did this, uh, dissemination of information and preparation of materials on drugs and sexuality, training for our health, uh, health agents. This is a training program, oops, there you go. It's a training program of around 25 hours, lecture, uh, lecture hours, and we have two parts theoretical session and practical session, because we said uh, we don't, this, if we are going to teach or we are going to train a young people, they need to put in action. So we need to mix these two um, uh, methodolo methodologies, right? And also because uh, we have a lot of uh, successful in these 20 years, um, we have trained more like 30,000 students among these years. Um, we created the new uh, network, it's called um, EPF network or in Catalan because it's, well, we have a little situation here with Catalan and Spain and everything, but uh, it's called Xarxa, it's mean network in Catalan, uh, EPF. To make this, uh, to give them to the student who want to keep working on this field, drugs, sexualities, and being a health uh, agent, um, given continuity to this project and to keep it uh, working on the field with not just university with another communities, you know, to take it out of the uh, of the classroom. So, um, with this, um, we have uh, this target group is our university students. Uh, we teach in different universities around this uh, Spanish state in Madrid, in Valencia, uh, in, in Catalonia, of course. And we have this uh, triple action of this training program because it's not just for the person himself, all this knowledge about drugs, about sexuality, how to handle risk and benefits of, of these uh, behaviors. Uh, it's also um, their university classmates because um, and I'm going to um, come in late, later more in this point. And also as a future professionals, because um, we implement this 25 hours course on different social sanitary uh, degrees, a psychology, nurse, nurse, nurse school, uh, sociology, uh, social education, and so on. So. Uh, these are careers that they are uh, very linked to uh, these social or more uh, biopsychosocial problems, no? Um, now we, uh, I told you before, but now we are, um, we are running the EPF, EPF program in four autonomous community, 11 university, 18 campus. So it's a pretty big project and it's very successful. Um, our methodology, and, I, and this is where I'm going to step a little bit more, is peer-to-peer -peer education. What is that? Um, when, you, when we talk about drug use or drug abuse or um, sexual uh, risk behaviors, um, we need to understand that these are topics, uh, they are very, uh, they don't talk about this 
so easily is difficult to access to the experience of these uh, students on, on these topics. So there's a methodology is called peer-to-peer -peer education where uh, you have to train your um, young people to uh, prepare them to give to the others uh, this preventive message because if you're if you have more um, the same, more or less the same age, the same context, where you move, where you go to party, or no, it's easier for the other to keep with that message, prevented message. It's different if I am going to tell them as authority, as a medical uh, doctor, or as, um, as a, a psychologist, as a teacher. Uh, this prevented message because they are not going to keep it. They are, um, they, this, we have this difference. So we need to train them to uh, make them this uh, and replicate the prevented message to make this health promotion through harm reduction and, of course, with a uh, gender perspective. Um, so we, as I said before, we talk about these three topics in this 25 hours course with uh, distribute, distribute these hours in, well, the presentation of the course and the rules of the course. Then two sessions about drugs, how to understand drugs from this um, uh, biopsychosocial uh, paradigm where we triangulate, we cannot understand drug use if we don't problematize with context, uh, drug effect, and your your own your own person. No, as Lisa said in in her presentation, uh, set setting and drug. And also, we talk about the effects. Let's um, the effect of the drug on uh, behavior and how to reduce. Uh, the risk associated with this use, because we know uh, at this point of the of the the life of the students, they they find very interesting maybe um, to try I don't know amphetamine for studying and then cannabis for relax uh, for relaxing after exam. So it's important to give them uh, tools for regulate and and manage. Uh, when to do it, how to do it, because we know they do it, <laughs> no? And also after this, we uh, have uh, two sessions of sexuality, also where we talk uh, a lot of um, ITS, I am sorry, I, I always have this confusion in English, the sexual transmission infections, STI, yes, <laughs> STIs, uh, HIV, um, also um, uh, LGBTQ plus collective and how to um, how to approach how to well make this a uh, safe space for people who want to talk about these topics and also we have this in the theoretical part of the course right we also uh, have these two sessions of myth uh, myths about equality between men and women it, that would be more like a how to introduce the gender perspective in in everything, right? In drugs, sexuality, but in, in life, no. So we we teach them um, uh, this myth about the uh, sexual division of work and the well related to this um, myth about equality between men and women. Um, when we have finished this part. We have this practical, no, because we don't. Um, we see that it's not make sense if you are going to teach them, but they are not going to make it a uh, put in, in how to say in action. No, it's, the knowledge is not going to stay. It's not going to keep it if you don't try it, right? So after this part, we um, well, we used to do <laughs> a, an intervention in campus. So we try, we uh, split the, the class in small groups and we, um, how to say, give them the, uh, to, cho to choose um, who
which topic want to they work? Why, which prevented match, message want to give to the other students? So they can choose if they want to work on drug use or, or um, sexualities or gender perspective. So we uh, may uh, we accompany this to this uh, small group. We make like um, tutorials, um, like support uh, to this group to um, construct, uh, build, sorry, build the this intervention that used to be in campus. But what happened? COVID is here, <laughs> so we had to adapt it super quickly. The thing is, we do this practical uh, part of the course because as we see in this, well, very simple <laughs> diagram, um, as, as, as we do as an EPF, we teach health agents, we train the health agents, and then they have to build this campaign or intervention in campus to um, pass the preventive measure to their classmates and other young people. So, uh, I, because I was telling you the COVID was very well surprising, we have to adapt to it super quickly. But after that, I want to teach this how we um, distribute, no, how that we understand the learning pyramid, no. There's um, there's in the top the less uh, with the less impact but not less important passive teaching methods lecture reading audiovisual demonstration um, this uh, powerpoint slides and everything and then we have participatory teaching method because this this is where the knowledge stay 50 percent group discussion 75 practice and 90 percent teaching others because because um, we organize this campaign or intervention in campus and we dedicate more than a half of the lecture hours to do this. So, as I was saying, <laughs> digital strategy because COVID-19 was arrived, no? So what happened, we were, t uh, we were doing this course uh, in four universities, if I don't mistake, and because all this uh, COVID situation and lockdown, we had to move everything to online because we didn't we didn't want to lose this uh, uh, future health agents or you no know, in in these topics. And because uh, we have to understand that we are working with young people, so where can we find young people? through social network, for example. So uh, we design, uh, we use tools for digital strategy as, for example, social networks, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, especially Instagram. We, we reach a lot of students through Instagram profile. So um, also uh, we have a website, of course, and we have, um, because all this adaption uh, because COVID-19, we designed a um, virtual classroom, especially for the EPF, where we could uh, do our 25 hours course. So um, also we have newsletter is how we communicate to our students what are we doing, yes, or to another professional who are interested in our, in our work. And also, uh, um, our digital strategy was where are the students in the social media, but also in, in games, for example, no? So this, I want to show this, this because this was an, uh, apply, uh, an, an app application, no? a game for your mobile, designed for a group of our students, because they say, well, we, can, we could create maybe uh, this game, uh, how, how to prevent and reduce risk, risk um, associated to the drug use. So they designed this with the help of another, uh, another group, more professional, yes, because as I said, we need to do su the support here. They are not alone, no? And they designed this application that you can find in Google 
in the app in the store of Google, not in the App Store, and not from Apple, just in Google Store. Uh, it's called Run for Fun. So it's about uh, well, a guy who is uh, have to go go out from a lab, from a maze, and they, he's finding different situations. No, he and how to how to keep uh, alive <laughs> and go out uh, going out of the maze uh, uh, in the full faculties, right? So it's pretty fun if you want to download. It's uh, available on uh, this Google Market uh, shop, <laughs> see, and it's for free. And also, we designed a harm reduction promotion interactive video. This is it was um, a video about this person. Uh, this person is called Alba, and she's telling you, "Okay, I am. Um, I am." I am rethinking over again how is uh, my habits, my my how is my health, and I, because I want to do a, a good year of, of university, I want to keep it clear and so on. Um, so what can I do? Maybe and she in this interactive video, maybe she said, okay, maybe I shouldn't go to many parties, maybe getting drunk a, a little bit less. Uh, may do some sport or control my drug use. So this is where she asks you for people who is watching this video. Can you help me to decide what should I do? So this this uh, video was also uh, thinking and designed for our students uh, many years ago. Well, many five years ago, more or less. And we have we were we were very successful because this is an, uh, a, a a near approach to youth youth sorry no um, also we use WhatsApp and an email email for the formal contacts if you if you want to keep it with this email and well send any question please uh, here are our contacts email. But also WhatsApp is a really important channel because we have this um, net, um, network of health agents who already did this course years ago. And we have to keep it, uh, we want to keep working on this field, going to universitarian parties and, and to make intervention in fields. So um, we need a direct channel of communication with these people and WhatsApp is the tool for excellence, no? Um, what else? Well, this digital strategies function was, uh, um, it's a very positive contribution because I said is keep it close between, between the program and youth with an horizontal approach. Um, oh, and also share information and the approach of risk reduction and transmedia reach young people visibility and accessibility and online peer to peer because we also believe we can do this peer to peer education through these uh, digital tools right um learning and values of our project since till now uh, well, the peer-to-peer -peer education, uh, it has bigger impact to pass this preventive message than if we I just teach for one hour or make a workshop of two hours about drug use. We need to keep it um, with a continuum because if not, um, these preventive, preventive actions will not keep it, uh, will not make a huge impact. Also, we believe in the content co-creation. I mean, we, we co-create um, these materials or what they want to specify or on which drugs, for example, or, or in which sexual risk situation to uh, make it more suitable for every reality because we know the reality in, for example, University of Barcelona is not the same reality that we have in Universitat de Lleida. It's another university here, 
it's one hour uh, distance from each other, but they have their own reality. So we keep it um, suitable for every every reality. Uh, also, we we don't uh, this spam to information. No, we um, we give them a lot of information that they could they can spread between through uh, their their equals, and because of this, they become a model for their own mates. So, if I have a problem with drug use or this sexual uh, risk behavior, um, maybe uh, it's probable that I am going to ask to a classmate, hey, I know you did this course, I know you have this information, How can, what can I do? It's, it's more accessible to another student, ask to another student about this problem than to a teacher or maybe a doctor, yeah? Um, one second, here. Also, and this is the more important thing in this uh, in this course, we have a realistic re discourse. I mean, we use um, we started for this topic that uh, we we are not going to deny that people use drugs. And if you don't want to have any risk, don't do it. That is our first me message. But if you decide to do it, you should know that, for example, the risk associated to you, cocaine use or methamphetamine use, no? And it's a very uh, close approach. As I said, we keep, we keep it horizontal and because we are assuming that the drugs are in our reality. Uh, also, because of this, we use this uh, harm reduction approach and non-moralistic. And this is super important for us because we teach through evidence-based, through uh, uh, studies, no? I mean, uh, we are not going to um, use moralistic discourses. We are going to see what is the evidence, what is work, what is not work um, in, in drugs field, especially in drug field, right? Um, 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 well, non-criminalizing speech in corporation as future professional. This is also important. As I said, this triple, triple function, no? Um, no, it's not just for them, for the inmates, it's, just, it's also for them as a future professional. And because we teach this course in different social san sanitary degrees, um, it's probably or highly, highly probably that they they will find cases through about drugs, about sexualities, about gender perspective. So we need to prepare to him, them, sorry, prepare them with this non-criminalizing speech because we know it's more approachable or it's a, have bigger impact in this a, a behave a change. Um, and um, yes, it's the, the impact, sorry, I'm sorry, the impact of this uh, non-criminalizing non speech is it's bigger than this moralist and non-evidence-based speech discourse. Um, also, uh, what about this online offline balance? Because we have this situation with COVID-19 COVID and everything. Well, we said digital strategy, it's okay. It helps, but it can be all. We need to keep it closer. We need to make reference of this. Uh, health agents that we are going to call them by, from now on, health agents have to be recognized for the other a student as health agent. They have to be people who transmit confidence about what they are talking about. So we also teach them how to speak about drugs, how to speak sexuality um, in this practical uh, part of the course, right? And the online strategy is um, to support the offline strategy. 
it's not all of that, but it's a, it's a very good channel to uh, visibilize what are we doing, where are we interventing, where, um, for example, there's a party in somewhere about, uh, of the medical school through online strategy, people who is in that uh, in that party can find us because we are, we want to talk with them. We, do you know how the the drugs affects you when you are going to drive, for example, or or topics like that? Also, um, we have a technical support as me <laughs> and also my partners here that well they apologize they couldn't come but well uh, because if not uh, these topics are difficult to manage for a lot of them and it's a mind break no for them so many times uh, so we need to make a, a um, we to do this technical support face to face with presence closeness listen and expression of space group approach um, and well um, yep so i um i don't know if i have everything uh i hope so <laughs> if you have i i am seeing questions in the chat so well i think that's all I, I hope you I hope you enjoy the 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 presentation. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, my my English is not that well. I hope you understand me. So well, I'm no here problem. for you. Thank you so much, uh, Ferenc. I really appreciate that. Uh, I think um, there are some questions in the chat, and we can perhaps touch on some of them um, during the discussion shortly. Okay. Um, and then those that we don't cover, as we discussed earlier, we'll just connect later on and, and prepare some recordings to share with the audience. Uh, if I might invite Vincent to come on and, and share his slides. Um, and, and while he does that, um, so Vincent is the technical executive manager at Higher Health. Um, those of you who aren't aware of Higher Health, Higher Health is an implementing agency for the Department of Higher Education and Training in, in South Africa. And their focus is on student health and wellness programs, including um, implementing programs on COVID-19, HIV, TB, uh, sexually transmitted infections, uh, sexual reproductive health, uh, including unplanned pregnancies, gender-based violence, alcohol, uh, drug abuse prevention, and mental health, amongst others. Uh, so uh, Vincent uh, is going to take us through uh, Higher Health's model for implementing the ADAP program uh, for students in, um, in the higher higher health sector. So go ahead, Vincent, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goodman. I am just going to switch on my camera for a little bit and uh, uh, say that uh, the, the, the audience on today's uh, platform will then engage with the voice, but at least they would have connected with the face. Um, just to say also to Florence and Lisa that they've made my um, brief talk very, very uh, easy for me in the sense that I think all the important things that I would have wanted to communicate uh, from our high health perspective as it relates to youth and the issue of substance abuse have been touched on broadly. Also importantly uh, from uh, <clears throat> Florence uh, presentation, uh, which I think was outstanding and fantastic. I can draw a lot, a lot of similarities between uh, the peer-to-peer -peer education program uh, that uh, is happening in, in Spain and with exactly what we are having here in South Africa. And just to say, before I comment on our model, which I think by the time I finish doing that, you, the penny will drop uh, for you, Florence, and others on call, um, that uh, the, the issues of um, substance abuse, uh, the way we have been re responding to them as, as an agency of the institution of uh, Department of Higher Education and Training. So I can't move my slides for some reason. Uh, okay, right, there we go. There we go, which is really a broad uh, sector, uh, cuts across different uh, uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, goes beyond our 26 universities to touch on 50 TBETs, uh, to touch on skills-based centers. It's across all nine provinces and 52 districts. Vincent, the important thing to um, know. 
Can I interrupt you for a moment? Would you mind swapping the display around so that we see your, oh. um, your, your slide and not your notes, if possible? Oh my word, okay, <laughs> all right. So my notes are showing, <laughs> sorry. It's all good. Uh, how do I swap this display? Okay. Uh, sorry, good man. No, go ahead. Okay. There's this is better. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Sorry about that, um, colleagues. So across the whole country, basically in every district, province, we have these training centers. The important thing to know here is that from our perspective, um, graduate competencies are so aligned and so linked to us taking care of um, youth health. So if we do not act in that um, important facet of their life, which is taking care of their health and wellness, then they cannot graduate, which means they cannot then contribute to the economy. Then we've lost a young life, which was supposed to affect grow the, the, the economic cake and also contribute uh, to livelihood of others. So it's very important, these interventions at this age. Suffice to say, uh, the challenges that we see amongst these young people, largely 15 to 24 in South Africa, I don't think it's unique to us, but the issues of alcohol and drug abuse uh, are rampant. And I want to highlight drug and alcohol abuse, not because uh, it's the topic of the day, but for me, you can draw some strong linkages and strong synergies uh, between uh, substance abuse and gender-based violence, which in itself has been identified as a co-pandemic to COVID-19. Similarly, uh, alcohol, a strong influence on mental health issues, a strong influence on issues to do with sexual reproductive health, HIV, TB and STIs, unplanned pregnancies, which is a big, big problem uh, amongst our beneficiaries. So our model tackles all these eight um, main challenges that we see amongst our beneficiaries. So substance abuse, once again, to re-emphasize, can be seen as an accelerant or in simpler terms, the fuel that makes this uh, fire uh, spread wider and faster. So dealing with substance abuse becomes a lot more important. Our model looks at the system and our model looks at the people. Um, so I want to touch on the system, which is on this right-hand side, colleagues, you will see uh, capacity development and skills transfer on protocols, on, on guidelines, on minimum standards and checklists. Uh, just to step back for a minute to say, uh, part of our team uh, involves a scientific uh, team. I'm part of that together with the CEO, but we do collaborate, uh, for example, with Dr. Goodman here where we're looking at developing uh, sector-specific uh, guidelines, uh, sector-specific minimum standards and checklists, which are broader and applicable to a wider audience. The aim is then that uh, the people who are responsible, custodians for making sure that graduate co competencies are built, will be the executive managers, will be the campus health uh, services, will also be the student support services take this information and translate it to their context. So the minimum standards that we provide at a bigger scale can then be tailored into institution level, into campus level. The topics, again, related, mental health, GBV, substance abuse, all those eight factors we look at at the same uh, time. So capacitation in that aspect. Then very similar to what uh, Florence was presenting is our, our capacitation to the student. So on the student level, because of comp competing priorities, particularly around accessing uh, your first curriculum, which is your routine curriculum that will allow you to progress and, and graduate and do plus, plus, plus that follows. And then coming in to attend these uh, sessions where you get information on your student health and wellness is how we do. So we integrate first into the first curriculum where there's life orientation, and then secondly, where there is none, we provide it as an extra mural second curriculum uh, where we, we are disseminating information on these health and wellness programs. So I want to move this to the next slide and focus only on the student. And I think this is where we have uh, strong similarities here with Florenska. On the primary level, 
uh, if we are conducting second uh, curriculum extramural activities, what uh, we do is we use a peer-to-peer -peer education program, very similar to what you've described in the previous presentation. So I'm thrilled and I hope we get a chance to share some more notes where we capacitate firstly students, we capacitate student advisors, we capacitate student peer educators on our curriculum. So it's a comprehensive curriculum that's got about nine, 10, 11 chapters. The important thing about this curriculum is that it is not only knowledge uh, sharing, it also goes to a second layer of intervention, which looks at um, assessing one's risks. So once you are aware of the issues that are, are around you, it is also important to know the issues that are directly affecting and concerning you. So the students who undertake a risk assessment questionnaire, and I'll show one towards the end of uh, my brief presentation. And the third goal of this intervention is once a person identifies as high risk, then they go into, into care. Once a person identifies uh, as low risk, they go into preventative care so that we maintain uh, uh, them out of uh, harm, basically. Um, so the goals of our program, very similar um, to, to what we have been discussing. Again, the emphasis is on harm minimization to talk about through leadership, student leadership, through the peer-to-peer -peer program, through the executive and student affairs and student health, that we start looking at what is around students in terms of availability of, of substances like alcohol and drugs, uh, the supply and how to reduce that, that and where somebody is uh, at a heightened risk already within that cycle that they are able to enter into um, harm reduction uh, uh, programs. So through the dialogues, if you're looking at a secondary level intervention, one has to go through, again, a very basic risk questionnaire. This summarizes the dialogue I've just had. We assess use and risk. If there's none, advise to avoid, to stop, to reduce, to moderate. If there is high, we refer. If it is, um, the risk is, is, is low or none, we are firm and engaged in supporting a mechanism. So this is the last slide I'm going to share with you colleagues, but I hope I'll get uh, some more time to interact with you around what we are doing in substance abuse and related uh, co-epidemics or pandemics uh, in the research sector. But uh, risk assessment questionnaire is binary. It's either a yes or a no. Uh, it's actually an interactive and a fun activity if you see it happening in person. Uh, so simple questions like, um, if you tried uh, to stop using or cut down on the amount of substance you use on your own, but you have not been able or have not been successful. So these are yes or no type of questions, but they trigger a thought process within a person, especially given that they've had information on awareness uh, on the risk of, 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 of uh, substance abuse and also what is immediately available uh, to them uh, once one does this, uh, in the red zone uh, activity, then they, it triggers interaction with a coordinator who links them to care again. The same uh, process ensues. So I would like to pause here, Dr. Goodman, and say I think my presentation has been very complimentary uh, to uh, Florence, and um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Vincent. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, and it indeed has been complimentary. And as I expected, uh, I think you can stop the screen share as well so that the slide can pull off the screen. Uh, thank you. So as I expected, uh, we probably won't have as much time as we would have desired to engage with all of the questions. Uh, but I, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Beg uh, to come on screen uh, so that she can provide sort of a, a round of commentary. I know she's had some questions that she's shared in the chat. Um, and um, she, you know, some of the questions we might in, in, engage on when we do our follow up engagement are around some of Vincent's questions around uh, whether the peer counselors get paid, uh, do they get peer counseling skills, so how do they get capacitated and supported. Um, I think we'll link that to some of our own resources, such as SADAG locally, to see uh, how we might mirror something like that. But I think from my side, similar to what uh, Dr. Big will speak to. There's a question around how do you actually measure impact and um, sort of uh, transferability, uh, but we'll certainly have that engagement later on. Uh, Dr. Beg, over to you and thank you. 
Thank you so much. And colleagues, that was a, a really great um, series of, of lectures. And I think um, uh, kind of the things that, that perhaps we really need to be engaging with students about um, and actually having students, um, student organizations present. Um, so it would be really helpful to, to share this, um, this recording, Goodman, um, because I think that there's uh, some real value in, in here. So I think that the parts that I've taken, taken out of this is that um, we have a very high use of, uh, of um, all substances, um, both in South Africa, particularly in the Western Cape, and that youth are, predominant, are, are significantly at greater risk, as Lisa indicated, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and that what we're really aiming to do is to ensure that um, we're also, that, that use doesn't become abuse or disorder. Um, and so, you know, for us to, I think, be quite clear about what it is that, that the, the intention behind things. And I think that actually came out in all three of the presentations. Um, and that I think what, what Lisa kind of ended off with was that whilst there's this increased predisposition for the youth um, is that treatment options are quite limited. And so then we started to look at both treatment options um, for Spain and then uh, that have been um, put into use in Spain and then what, what higher health are doing. I found it quite interesting that we had um, multiple triangular um, uh, examples throughout um, the three presentations. So um, clearly there's something about triangles and sets of three today. Um, so the drug setting and the set um, followed by the person, the peer and the professional um, and, uh, and then rotating down into levels in the high health and upside down triangle with a funnel. So um, I did just, and then uh, sex, drug and gender was another one, Florence, that you introduced that, that actually we're really talking about risk behaviors here. We're not just talking about substances. Um, so it's really all about risky behaviors and harm. And so we're really talking about harm reduction and harm minimization. Um, so I think that, that what Florence showed us with, with a peer-to-peer -peer program is that obviously the benefits are in terms of access, um, that we can, with peer-to-peer, -peer we can distinctly improve access um, and, and this concept that, uh, that our students become health agents um, and that, the, that, that Florence was able during COVID, um, 20,000 students is a huge cohort to reach. Um, across 18 universities. So, you know, that's something that we could definitely look at. And I'd, I'd love Vincent to share with us what the reach has been in South Africa. Um, but certainly the pivoting to, to online and digital seems to have almost been easier with youth than, um, than in other settings. So, you know, so it can actually be seen as an advantage and not a disadvantage. I think the, the whole concept of co-creation and modeling and, and really understanding that whilst, um, Students and uh, may well be youth may well have less developed frontal cortexes to be able to manage their risky behaviors. Nevertheless, they have they come with assets, and that they actually are part of the solution. That there's there isn't this top down approach to be able to kind of lecture as to how to do better. And I think that was a really useful insight from Florence around co creating and for peers to model to to each other. Um, and uh, I think the, the concept of, of harm reduction and, and being non-moralistic, uh, non-criminalizing, um, and, and I think that the linkage between preparing for as a professional. So um, to me, it spoke into the graduate attributes aspects of both being a health advocate as well as the professional, um, as well as a communicator. And so in a sense, we're actually then speaking to the hidden curriculum. Which, which then was what Vincent was speaking to in terms of what he called the second curriculum. So I found that was, um, that was really interesting um, to do that. So we, we kind of preparing for the profession. Um, I think that, that the aspect that Vincent then brought in, which was really important for us in South Africa is the gender-based violence aspect and that um, substance use is often a fuel for that fire. Um, and so I think um, that, that all in all, we're really kind of looking towards harm minimization, harm reduction. And I think, uh, Florence, I think you had a great conversation about having a very real conversation. And I think in South Africa, we often tend to have, we find difficult conversations um, tricky. Um, and, and so I think the more tools we can give into all spaces to have tough and difficult conversations and to give youth, but also lecturers that ability to be able to have 
those difficult conversations um, that are real and realistic, but not moralistic. Um, I think sounds like um, there, are, there are plenty of lessons to learn. So I think it would be really fantastic for us to hear some of the impact studies that have been done on these interventions um, and, and look at the way that we can go. So personally, what I'm taking away is we have peer mentors and um, I'm gonna be taking some of these to discuss with the psychologists who work with the peer mentors and seeing whether uh, we can directly implement um, some of what we've discussed today into the UCT frame. So thank you colleagues, that was really, really uh, valuable to, to attend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I wanna just thank the speakers one more time. And again, thanks to Deanery for making time to be present today and for those closing comments. Uh, and thanks to the department for joining us. Uh, we'll send around the recording um, and have a good day. Keep safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.